Continuing 6.6, .6, human interaction with flooding. Dynamic equilibrium. First, land use change. Forest to farm. At first, the stream is out of equilibrium. Trees and year-round vegetation gone leads to more land erosion. If you don't believe me, go find a farmer's field and watch the irrigation water runoff. Is it clear or dirty? Much of that dirt is just the nice, soft soil eroding away. So we know that the stream already carries as much sediment as it can based on its velocity, which is based on its gradient. Well, with the land use change, the stream is being asked to carry more sediment. So what does the stream need to do? Will our stream just give up? No way. Streams are not quitters. That would be weird. No. The stream flows on. But with all that sediment, it needs to flow faster. Otherwise, the sediment would be deposited. And actually, some of the sediment does get deposited, raising the stream bed. But as the stream still has the same base level, a rise in the stream bed causes a rise in the gradient, which means the stream will flow faster until it can carry the new sediment load. And voila, the stream is back in equilibrium. Got it? Make sense? If not, try listening to it again before continuing. And if that doesn't help clarify things, ask. So in summary, more land leads to more sediment leads to more sediment in the stream, which leads to a steeper steam stream gradient. And that leads to a higher stream velocity, so that there is a higher stream sediment load and the stream is back in equilibrium. Farming to forest causes the opposite effect. Suddenly the stream becomes sediment starved meaning it can carry more sediment than it is. What does it do? Look in the, mo in the mirror and admire its skinniness? No, that again would be weird. Streams will not starve themselves if they can help it. They will eat. They will pick up sediment if it is available, and in this case it is. The sediment they pick is the sediment deposited on its bed when the forest was changed to a farm. So the elevation of the stream bed decreases, and as the base level is still the same, the gradient will decrease, causing the velocity of the stream to decrease until it reaches a new equilibrium with its new sediment supply. If you don't believe, I will show you a real live cartoon. Here it is. First, look at the image. It is a cross section of the stream. So the stream is flowing in or out of the screen. You have the original bank prior to agriculture. This area was a forest before it became a farm, probably just prior to 1930, when the cross section shape of the stream bed drastically changed following the highest black line contour. In this area, farming became unprofitable and some forests returned to the area around 1969. And again, the cross-sectional shape of the stream changed to um, the middle thin black line. The stream bed elevation was lowered as compared to the 1930 farm dominant stream bed elevation, but was still higher than the original stream bed elevation when the area was primarily forest. So how did this affect the overall gradient of the stream. I'll show you. Look at the graph on the right. The x-axis is distance downstream. The y-axis is elevation above base level. The two blue lines on the graph are two longitudinal profiles of a stream. So again, the base level stays the same for the stream. But when the stream cannot carry all the sediment and deposits some of the sediment on its bed, the elevation of the bed is raised. For instance, from the bottom blue line to the top blue line, which results in increasing the gradient 
of the longitudinal profile on the stream. The gradient becomes steeper, which means the velocity increases, which means it can carry more sediment, which means the stream gets back into equilibrium. But it has changed. So what if the base level changes? That's our next example. Dam. A reservoir becomes a new temporary base level. Remember that curve in the longitudinal profile? As the stream reaches the base level, it slows and drops its sediment, forming a delta. In the reservoir, the water is nice and still and drops even more sediment. When the water leaves the reservoir, it starts moving again, which means what? Can it carry more sediment than it could before? Is it starving? Yes. So what will the stream do? Will it stay starved? No, it will eat. What I mean is that it will pick up sediment and erode down to a new elevation where the amount of sediment it can carry and the velocity of the stream have reached a new equilibrium. Have you seen this phenomenon in your experience with reservoirs? It's true. This is what happens. Reservoirs are constantly being silted in, and dams constantly have erosion at their outflow. Here's a dam. See the sediment dropping as the river enters the reservoir? You can see the color change from brown water to blue. Now see the outflow. The water is no longer a deep blue color. It is a light blue due to the sediment it is picking up. Erosion. See, it's real. Dynamic equilibrium. Human interaction, urbanization. Increases frequency about threefold and it also increases the magnitude of flooding. This is because the water enters stream channels more quickly, i.e. decreases lag time. This decrease in lag time causes flashy discharge, which sounds pretty gross. Flashy discharge is the rapid rise and fall of flood water as the storm water quickly gets flushed into and down streams. However, in larger basins, large floods are not affected. What do I mean by a large flood? Well, I mean larger than about the 50 year flood. Let me show you the graphs. Here they are. Time on the x axis, discharge on the y axis. What is discharge? Is it height of the stream? No. Is it correlated with temperature? No. Is it the volume of water per time that flows in a stream? Yes. Okay. On the graph, we have a storm that causes rainfall. That's the blocky rectangular shape on the left of the graphs. And then we have the rise and fall of discharge in the stream with a nice bell curve shape. We also have marked the lag time. On the top graph, we have a typical more natural conditions. In the bottom graph, we have more urbanization. So what do you notice? Which graph has a longer lag time? The one with the natural conditions. How about stream flow patterns? Does one kind of look kind of flash flood-like? I would say yes. The graph depicting conditions under urbanization, the bottom one. That's really what a flash flood is, a quick runoff of precipitation into the stream with a rapid rise and fall in stream depth. There's your flashy discharge, and the flood crests at a higher stage. Thus urbanization increases the magnitude of the flood. Next graph shows that urbanization increases frequency and magnitude of flooding.
Runoff can be five times greater than pre-urban conditions due to both decrease in lag time and increase in impermeable cover. Think how much water seeps into asphalt and concrete. Not much. All that water gets routed into storm drains, which quickly make it into streams. Flashy discharge. Okay, look at the graph. X-axis and percent of land area covered with storm sewers. The top number, impervious cover. Bottom number, oh, look at the graph. X-axis and percent of land area covered with storm sewers, the top number. Or impervious cover, bottom number. On the y-axis is the ratio of overbank flows as compared to pre-urbanization conditions. So with no land area covered, the ratio is 1, right? Just comparing initial conditions to initial conditions. But when 20% of the land area is covered, overbank flows, i.e. flooding, doubles. The ratio goes to 2 as compared to initial conditions. When 50% of the land area is covered, we are close to four times more flooding. You can see the trend. And urbanization also affects stream quality. Urbanization reduces groundwater recharge, which means that there will be less stream flow during dry seasons when the stream is fed by groundwater. As dilution is the solution to pollution, less water in the stream means more pollution in the stream, i.e. decreased stream quality. This includes increased stream and sediment pollution, and floods also aid in pollution transport, washing all that city stuff into the streams, hydrocarbons, bottles, shopping carts, etc. In addition, occasionally bridges block debris, creating unstable dams and flash flooding when debris dams break. So in summary, urbanization increases the magnitude and frequency of the flood hazard, as well as generally decreases stream quality. Poor rivers. But we are not powerless. 6.7. Minimizing the flood hazard. We will be discussing physical barriers that minimize the flood hazard. These include earthen levees, concrete flood walls, reservoirs, and stormwater retention basins. All physical barriers need to be maintained. Oops, the levee below needs some work done. Levees can cause higher energy flows by straightening the channel and more severe upstream flooding by causing bottlenecks. Next picture is of a concrete flood wall. They can also be parallel to the stream, can cause the same problem as levees. Here is a reservoir They cause flooding upstream to hold it back from flooding downstream. Helpful only if you are downstream and the dam doesn't break. <laughs> and this image is of a stormwater retention basin. You may see these in your neighborhoods and parks. They are depressed areas that often has no water at all, but there are inlets, outlets to let stormwater collect and then drain away. Another way to minimize the flood hazard is channelization. This is straightening, deepening, widening, clearing, or lining existing stream channels, which can improve navigation and decrease flooding. But of course, that's not all. The image on the right compares many features of natural stream and channelized stream. I'll read and summarize it for you. Channel conditions, natural stream. Suitable water temperatures, adequate shading, good cover for fish life, minimal temperature variations, abundant leaf material input. For the channelized stream, it's different. 